Bueno, empezamos. Buenos días, Barcelona. No, 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 más, más. Buenos días. Gracias. Okay, so now I will continue in English because that's a bit easier for me, sorry. <laughs> so today I will actually not do a talk. This will be just code. So I want to show you how you can actually perform a very complex refactoring, right? Because I think that's something that is quite difficult for all of us. So my original idea was to show you some really complex code. Let's say my goal was at least a thousand lines of code and really complex business logic. Well, unfortunately, I had to realize sooner or later that, well, I'm sure you are smart enough to follow me doing that in like 50 minutes, right? But I had to realize I'm not so smart. So I had to find a balance here, right? So I still did not want to show you like a very simple Hello World example because <laughs> refactoring Hello World is maybe not so exciting and the question is, would you learn anything at all? So I have found here this code, uh, brute force Sudoku solver. And I hope this is the balance that we need here. So I hope everyone who here knows Sudoku. So who here knows Sudoku? OK, I would say like 90% at least. So that's helpful if you know Sudoku. If not, well, Sudoku has some business logic and, and, and some rules, which I will quickly, really quickly explain. I'm sure you can come along even when you don't know Sudoku in detail, right? Because obviously, I want to explain refactoring and not Sudoku, right? But in a real scenario, obviously, that's the main thing, that the, the first takeaway that I want you to have, because that's also the first thing that I had to learn the hard way. Because when I started that, I was like, Actually, yeah, Sudoku is that thing, you know, with a box and some numbers, and I didn't know in detail, but I was like, oh, I'm a smart guy. <laughs> I can do that, right? Well, I had to take a step back. I had to buy a book booklet of Sudoku, and I had to actually play it. <laughs> and that's really important, right? We, we, we very often think we're so smart, we don't need that business logic, code is so cool, right? <laughs> Let's directly jump into the code. And here, I would really recommend, take your time, really deeply understand the business logic, because if you don't, you will never be able to perform a uh, refactoring, right? So this here um, is code written in 2005 in Java 5, so it has some age. So that's one of the reasons why I think this is some legacy code that is good for refactoring also. It was written by Patrick Chan. So this is copyrighted, and I got the permission from Patrick, so thanks for that again, to refactor this today. And Patrick is really far from a bad coder. He's actually a very, very experienced coder. He has worked for Sun Microsystem, I think, even at the time. Now I think he's working for Yahoo. And, well, first of all, he was writing that in Java 5, right? And second, he was writing that for a different purpose. He had a website at the time, and he just wanted to write this code in a minimal amount of lines of code, right? So we here today will have a different goal. We want to make this really readable code that everyone can understand and maintain. And obviously today with Java 12, we have some more magic at hand that he did not have, right? So, um, so he, because he, he is a good coder, he, he did a, few, a lot of things really good. A few things I think we can, for our purposes, improve. So uh, let's see. Well, first of all, this is also working code. If it wasn't working code, then this would not be legacy code. That would be something, but not really helpful. So let's assume this is really helpful, sorry, for the business. And the problem, however, is there are no tests, right? So I think this is a very typical scenario that there are no tests in a legacy code. And here we have the problem. Well, the code is complex. It's hard to understand, and we would want to have tests so we can touch the code but we can't write the tests because the code is too complex. So we are like in a vicious circle or chicken and egg uh, uh, kind of problem where we don't know what we should do, right? Whatever we do, we will fail, right? And that's why many developers that I have met in such a situation and in a real business situation would say, let's just not touch the code, right? Let's just do the minimal amount needed to add the new feature. I don't know if you know this Jenga game tower. 
uh, this, this game with the Jenga tower where you work in pairs and then one person takes out a stick, puts this on top and so on and so forth until this uh, Jenga tower crashes. And the last person that touched the tower is then the guilty one. Yeah, we play that game in the business, right? <laughs> well, for me personally as a craftsman, I don't like to play that game, right? I'm sure we are all here super smart people, but we should also be very brave, right? And sometimes we have to face such a code, and we have to touch it. And yes, it can break, and I would even say it will break. It has broken for me a thousand times. So take that for granted, it will break, right? So if it breaks, and if we have no tests, what can we do? First of all, we have to be super careful. Obviously, we have to proceed in baby steps. And we have to make sure that we have a test as soon as ever possible. Today here, again, I had to take a compromise. I will not be able to write like a full coverage of unit tests, but this does not mean that I'm recommending you not to write tests. Tests are super, super important, and I want you to remember we want this test pyramid, right? With lots of unit tests in the bottom. Today only we have the special situation where I will focus on the code and I want to show you how to proceed a refactoring in, in certain steps, so I will kind of cheat here a bit. Just don't get me wrong that I'm saying you should do the same thing in your scenario, right? So, um, as you see, this code is working. So let's now also maybe ex explain a bit how Sudoku works. So here we have a field of 81 cells, right? We have nine rows, we have nine columns, and we have these nine boxes here. In every box is here, it's, it's hard to mark them. In every row, in every column, in every box, there should be the numbers from one to nine. So every number should appear once. We start with the board partitionally filled, like you can see here. And so the dot here in this case indicates a missing number. This was implemented in a way that you could also do this with a zero. And this was implemented in a way that this is parsed from this text file here, right? And then this brute force algorithm tries to find a solution. So how does this, is this done? We go to the first empty cell. This would be this one here. Now we check, can we put here a one? No, we cannot because the one is already here. Can we put here a two? Well, a two is not in the row, cool. Unfortunately, a two here is in the column, so we cannot take a two either. Three is also not working. Four is not working because it's here in the box. What about five? Five is working, and as you can see here below, this is actually also the solution. So in this case, brute force would have directly found the solution, but there could also be other cases where, let's, let's just assume, you know, we would want to put here a six, and a six would also work at this state, but then later on we might find out, well, here we need a six. This is the only possible way. And in this case, we have to roll back and this is what the algorithm does. It's recursively calling itself, and on top, it's tr it tries to find several solutions. And because if the field is really only filled with few numbers, there could potentially be unlimited number of uh, uh, solutions. I mean, not unlimited, but you get the idea. And because of that, it terminates when it has found at least two solutions, right? So this is what you can see here. There were two solutions found, and it terminated. Okay, so now. Because we have no test, I said it will break. So what can we do instead? Well, there are definitely other solutions. First of all, manual testing, QA, right, traditional. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. And B, uh, you can have <coughs> some techniques in production. Uh, for example, you could have on production one release that is running, and now you do a refactoring, and then you deploy that, um, and then you do a canary release, that means that um, you can switch over and you can show the second release only to a very small number of uh, people, for example, all the people in your uh, company or department, and then you can take your time and test this until you think it's ready. And obviously, you will never know for sure. You can also switch back and forth, right? So this will definitely help you here, right? So. Now, what else can we do now to actually start the refactoring? 
So you see also there's lots of lots of comments. I would want to like write as much code and replace the comments with code because I mean this is a lot of text to read and actually I even found some bugs in this text. So because we have to be so careful, I would always want to start with the things that are the least dangerous. And what is least dangerous for me might be something else for you, right? So the way I start, you might start a bit differently, but I think the one thing that we can hardly break the code is by just formatting it. And I think that's a very good start, because I think, at least I believe so, some might disagree, that we should have auto-formatted code that we all trust in, that we all have the same format, right? So that we can work as a team, okay? And the code that you see here is not the perfectly original one from Patrick. I have worsened it, changed it a bit where necessary to make a point. For example, here, you can see that I have made visible these empty spaces. And this is actually also how I code, because I want to see, like, are there tabs used or spaces used? Here they're used interchangeably, and I think this is really bad in any case, right? From what I know, the majority of Java developers would agree on that we use uh, spaces, and that's also what I prefer. But if you, in your team, prefer tabs, that's also cool, as long as you are consistent, right? Okay, and now I'm doing this manually to keep it simple. You could also have many other techniques here. For example, you could have a hook once you check in that this gets uh, uh, formatted. In any case, I would format this as early as ever possible. Okay, so this is the first thing that we could do. And now, as you can see here, I'm using IntelliJ IDEA. You, know, you might be using Eclipse or, I don't know, NetBeans, whatever you use. Any kind of modern IDE should have some refactoring capabilities where your IDE helps you to refactor the code for you. So this is probably also not very dangerous. Assuming that you can trust your IDE, you should be fine. So I would then start with that next. So I go here to Analyze, Inspect Code. And now nothing is coming. Okay, don't know. So let's leave this for now. So in any case, the idea is um, that we perform these automated uh, refactorings. I guess you get the idea. And this will help us to improve our code in the first step without really having a lot of risk. In the next step, I would work on variable names and I would work on magic numbers like this. Because here we have the comment array that contains values of all 81 cells in the grid. Huh. I think we can improve that, and we can make this here constant, right? So for example, extract constant, max cells. And now, this is cool here, I can even move this directly into a constant class. So dopo constants. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then I can on top yeah, make this a static import. Okay, and now I would proceed like this for all the magic uh, numbers, right? On top also, I would also even work on, on, on sorting. You might think like sorting, why is that important? Well, the thing is, the first step that we do, the main reason why we do this is just to touch the code so that you familiarize yourself with the code. So, and in a very, in a way that is very not uh, so dangerous, right? And sorting, like what I usually do is, for example, here in this case, we have rows and columns. But he starts with columns and rows. But I would speak of, we have a table that has rows and columns. So at least that's how I would speak it. So that's why I would personally now put rows in front of the columns. And I would do so, obviously, if there's methods consistently all over my entire code. OK. And again, that should not be risky. And again, this should help me to better understand the code. OK, what else? Now this is again something that people might disagree with. Reader RD. I personally am not a big friend of these short variable names, RD. Now the question, however, is we don't know this code yet, so what, could we, what better variable could we take? We would probably know at the very end, 
but at the beginning it will be hard. So the best name that I can come up at the beginning might just be reader. Now for me personally, that is still better than, than RD. But I guess, as I, as I said, you can disagree. This is just so that I feel better about the code. That I get into the code and that I get a better feeling with this, right? Now for example, there's also lock. This took me a while to find out lock. What he actually means here is the cell index. So let's rename this cell index. And by the way, if you can, if you understand your code properly, be as precise as possible. But I mean, don't overdo it. Don't think forever, because you will, over time, the more you touch the code, get deeper and deeper learnings. And you can refactor this again, rename the variable again and again. But for example, here it, it's called R. So what he probably meant is row. But row is actually wrong. What he actually should have said is row index. So I would want to really be specific because row is something else than row index, right? So I would this now rename to row index. Okay, so, and so forth and so on. I hope you get the idea. The next thing that I would do is now extract some simple, very simple methods. For example, like this here. I mean, the way he calculates the row index from the cell index is always the same. And it's actually used in various places. So we can extract this to a method. So let's also call this row index. And with just a few clicks. And here you see my IDE has already found the second place. So now we have extracted that to a method. And that's far from perfect yet. Remember, we're proceeding in baby steps. So at a later time, we will again remove that, change that, right? So we are doing just one step at a time to be super, super, super careful because we have no tests, right? And we, at this stage, we want to get the learnings that we need to understand the code enough that we are able to write some, some kind of test. Okay, and the last thing that I want to show you is somewhere here. So what I also usually do in this case is extracting Boolean methods. This can also help a lot. For example, here again we have this lock. So let's first of all call this cell index. And then second, extract this. And here's the comment. If no empty cells are found, a solution is found. Huh. Right? So why not putting this into a method name? And so I extract that. No, what was it again? No empty cell found. No empty cell found. OK. So, and now finishing up this step could easily take us one to two hours. So do you have time till like tomorrow <laughs> so we can re finish this refactoring? Because the entire refactoring will take us like easily and a day, I guess, if we know exactly what we're doing. If not, it could take us several days. So I have to now jump a bit. And I just hope that you, you got the idea of this first step. By the way, oh, this I might also show you. So in this step, this constant class will grow, obviously. And this, again, is a balance. Everything is a balance in coding. As long as it's not too big, and you be the judge what means too big, when it's not too big for you. Then this is cool. And it can even help us to better understand the code and tell us a story, as we'll see as soon as I jump to the next step. But as soon as this is growing too complex, too large, it might not be so cool anymore. And this is the case where you have to again change that code, and you might want to extract these constants in, for example, their own enum classes or classes, right? So nothing is ever final, unlike maybe in the code. Yeah, OK, so now we jump. And this step, then we will also see a very first smoke test. OK, so now within this step, I was not able to write a very small test also. This test is good and bad. On the one hand, it's cool, because, but that's a very specific thing about Sudoku. The way here this, this, this program is running, it allows me just with these very few lines, it was super simple to come up with this test 
and it will guarantee me that A, the output is correct, and B, that also the algorithm is correct, because by just testing the string here, I'm actually testing the entire solution, right? So when this is working, then I'm fine. On the other hand, this is not enough. I expect more from my tests. I not only do I want to know that it's working, if it's not working, I want to know specifically, if possible, which line is broken, so that I save time, right? And this, this test would not be able to do. But as I said, this talk here, or coding here today, unfortunately, is not about testing. It would be its own talk. So I hope you get the idea and you would add a lot of unit tests on top. OK. So let's maybe run this test once. And there it was. Right. So now this has passed. OK, cool. Now let's also look at what we did. So the constant now, as I, as I promised you, has grown. Very often I make classes uh, final because, sorry, I'm not a big friend of inheritance. So I try to prevent inheritance if I didn't think about like what is the result if someone tries to inherit here, I would make this final. And should my opinion change later on, I can still remove this final, but it's also a message to the next developer. I didn't think at all about inheritance. So if you think you want to remove final and you want to inherit here, you're on your own, right? There is no support for me. <laughs> OK. And I also don't want that anyone would call this uh, class. It's just a stupid constant class at this point, which is why I'm making this, this constructor here private. And I will even uh, enforce that this is never being called through re reflection, right? OK. And I've started to group even some of the constants here. And now this is what I meant. If you just look at this here, no solution found, two solutions found, one solution found, this is starting to tell us a story. And this is helping us now to understand the code. And I had told you before that we're parsing, but even if you wouldn't know that, just by looking at new line car, empty dot car, empty zero car, file end, you could get the idea there's some place where there's parsing. And we could jump to this place if we would follow where this is actually used, right? OK. So now let's look at this code that has slightly been improved. And we see here this is. The main logic, find empty cell, update, reset, right? So here we have the helper methods, row index, box index, column index. Actually, here I broke my rule that I told you it should be sorted. So maybe let's do this right now. Okay. So, but if you look at this now, at least this is how, how it felt for me, there is still one thing that really hurts me, that's really hard to digest. I mean, now I get it because I've worked on this code quite a few hours. But for you probably, I mean, what about this guy here? What is that? And there's more of that. This one here, and there's more of that. This one here. So I don't know about you, if you're the experts about bit fiddling. When I'm thinking in Java, I mean, we had this stuff, right, when we studied computer science. But like when I'm thinking in Java, I'm thinking more like in an object-oriented way. And then I have a hard time seeing that and understanding that. Well, I saw that in some hash code logic. So I still remember this is something about shifting. But now, how does this work? Is this a left shift? Is this a right shift? Is this shifting the 1 by value? Or is this shifting value by 1? OK, we can look that up, right, Google? Uh -huh. We'll find a block. I'm sure we will find the solution. But A, this is boring. B, this will take us time. And C, can we trust the block? So who is the author of that block? It's dangerous, right? Not everything we, 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 we want to believe, everything on the internet is true, but sometimes it's not. <laughs> right, and do you want to trust your production release on the internet? <laughs> dangerous. And then also, even if you do find something and you trust this source because, I don't know, it's, it's your, your friend or whatever, or it's some company that you believe in, what is this here in combination, right? Well, I do remember this is an OR, so something with an OR binary logic, right? But what is this guy here? Huh? And where's the other one here? And here, I guess we all know this is an AND. 
And so this is probably about zero and one, is zero, one and one is zero, and so on, you know, this stuff from computer science. But again, how does this work in combination? I think now it gets tricky. And I think you will have really a hard time to find exactly that in a block. You would, want to, uh, you would have to find a block about Sudoku or even exactly about this code. Maybe if someone writes a review about my, co about my talk here, he would f tell you exactly how this is working. But unless this is done, we will not find the solution. So what can we do? Huh. And this is a technique that I really like and that I want to show you. We can program, right? So why not just writing some code experiments, abusing a test here, I mean, this is not tests, so that we get the answer. And so, first of all, let's look at the update logic. So what I did here, I have extracted this logic directly from the code that we saw before. So here with the or, one, something, 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 and so on, and reset. There's more, but we have already used 27 minutes, so I'll probably not have the time to show you everything here. But let's at least look at update and reset. Okay, so I've called this row bit vector because, I mean, this is actually already telling you a bit of this uh, uh, about the solution. But let's ignore this for now. Uh, it's, just a, it's just a simple int. And we're starting with zero. And now what I want to, I want to somehow magically update a three, right? Let's see what this does, let's see what happens, let's just do it. Let's just throw in my function a three and see what happens, what is the output. And, I mean, obviously we can't do these code experiments if we don't know anything. So, at least you would have to understand this is about binary logic. So this much I would assume you can figure out, if not Google, <laughs> a starting point, sorry, or your best friend, right? So, and because it is binary logic, we have to print out the result on a base of two. So let's just do this. What happens if I do this? So I'm running this as a test, but it's not a test. It's just a code experiment. So the result that I get here is 1, 0, 0, 0 for a 3. Okay? That gives me an idea. Let's see if I'm right, but just further playing around. You know, and playing around is fun, right? At least more than reading a blog for 20 minutes. So here we see the result is 1, 0, 0. So now we see we have two zeros. So now I start to get really an idea of how this is working. Seems to be like a flag. So the one is indicating I have a two, I have a three, I have a four. But let's further do some further experiments. Because what is with a four? Now I have four zeros. And now the final thing that I want to know. Okay, better? So, and now what I want to know is what happens if I do this actually twice, right? Because I want to see the boundaries of this code. How does this actually react when I'm not doing as I should, right? If I'm not a nice guy. And we're often not nice guys, right? Or nice girls. So I'm doing this twice and I want to know. Will this stay a 4, as in the flag? Will this be a 16 or will this be a 8? Will this be a minus 4? Will there be a warning, an exception? I have no idea. Let's just run it. And I do run it, and I see this is just a 4 as it was before. And now I have two things. A, I start to better understand this code, and B, I start to also see its limits and a good reason why I would want to change that. And so my, my, my first gut feeling that I don't like this bit fiddling now is even stronger, it's dangerous, right? So let's see how, how that is with reset. So with reset, I start with a zero again. And uh, obviously, I cannot reset something that is not there. So let's first of all use the update function that we used before. And let's put that there. And then I want to reset the exact same value that we did before. And I would expect that if I have a 2 and I reset the 2, I should get a 0. So let's see if this is working as expected. And yes, it is. Cool. But now again, I'm a nasty guy. 
So let's see what happens if I reset on just a zero, right? So I skip this update part. Again, will this lead to an exception? What will happen? No idea. Let's try. And this now is interesting, and this is even more, I think, evil. I would even call it evil, because now we have a two. Why is that so? Well, if we look in the code, reset, and if we now do some Googling, we will find out this is actually an XOR, and obviously in XOR, this is how it's working, right? If it's there, and then we do the switch, it will be gone, but if it was not there, it acts like the update. And now I think this is really a strong indicator that we have here, like a hidden bug. If this is in the code, two months later, your colleague that did not know about this fact and forgets to, to, uh, to just, for example, calls the reset twice or calls the reset without having a called update before, this can lead to nasty bugs and we will not find that so easily. So now I think I know enough to be able to refactor that. So now again, I will do my Google session is there something that can do this better? And I did that, and I found out there is a class called bitset, which is also why I called this bitset then, that does exactly what we need here. So I would want to use that instead of this bit fiddling. If you need the last kind of performance, you know, leave performance maybe for the experts or leave that for later. Don't start with crazy bit fiddling just because you think it's cool and because you think you can, you might fail. <laughs> so let's start very simple, and later on we can optimize everything, right? So, uh, and the funny thing is, this bit set actually existed since Java 1, right? So, and so I want to now replace this with bit set, but because, like, we already used 32 minutes, I have to jump again. And, yeah, it's like, you know, in a cooking show, the cake is ready, ta-da! <laughs> yeah, so. Now we have actually done a lot, so we will now enter the main part of this refactoring. So I will have to show you a bit that I did in the meantime. But let's start with this bit set, okay? So now we have used this bit set three times. This, by the way, I didn't tell you initially, is like an optimization that was done by Patrick, and this is something that I really like, because to find out in our Sudoku logic, if I have a certain cell, can I put here a certain number, can I put a here a one? So I have to check the row, the column, and the box. And that can be quite complex if I have to always scan my entire uh, uh, array, right? And to speed up this process, he has created these arrays here. Just, I personally didn't like that bit fiddling, so now I have removed that. Again, you might disagree if you perfectly, you know, you perfectly know what you're doing there, you perfectly understand that, disagree with me, do it differently. Because in the end, we want to have a nice code in the end, a tested code, that's what matters and might be different for you or in your team. Okay, so now I personally think that now the code got much more readable because now we have here in this allowed function, we have this bit set here, it's still an array, and we have here a get function that we call. And this is now actually returning us a Boolean. So we're not on this binary level anymore. And even we have some security, for example, we have here an index out of bounds exception if we're trying to have an index below zero, right? And this is maybe not the best yet, but it gets better. I think here also update. I mean, it would even be nicer if this was called update, but I think now at least the code gets more readable, right? And here, this one I like even more. Here we have a clear. So the clear is what we need for the reset, and I think now this really star starts to get much better understandable than this crazy bit fiddling logic that we had before, right? So, now I did much more, obviously, also, because I also started to work on um, extracting more logic into their own methods and in, in, in their own classes, because I want to, like, work a lot on single responsibility principle, or also the name that I prefer would be, um, I want to have high cohesion and low coupling. So, step by step, I'm, I'm getting there. So the file parsing logic that we didn't even look at um, because of the time, I have now extracted into just this small static method. Static is always not so object-oriented, right? So be careful with that. But in this case, I think it's okay. Very simple method. Um, there was also, when I did that, I also found a uh, bug that was hiding because um, the stream was not like always closed. I think it was not closed at all. 
Now I'm using this method. I think it was introduced in Java 7. And this one will ensure, as the documentation here says, the method ensures that the file is closed when all bytes have been read, or an I.O. error, or a runtime error. So in any case, this will close the file. So this is much better. And the code is much simpler than it was before. Right? And I'm directly handling the exception before we had this throws exception. I'm not a big friend of this signatures throws exceptions. And I'm also not a big fan of, uh, uh, of these uh, checked exceptions. Java was the first language that introduced checked exceptions, and also the last. So for me personally, <laughs> that tells us something. C Sharp has taken a lot of inspiration, let's call it so, from Java. But it has not taken that inspiration for checked exceptions. So um, I mean, this is still, some people might disagree and say, oh, checked exceptions are great. But in any case, we should probably handle them. I, in, ca in this case, have not properly handled that, because like in my specific, it's still a stupid example. OK, let's face it. So if I can't find the file, what could I do now? Right? Then probably someone has fiddled around on my computer, has deleted the file. So I would want to see that on the console, would want to fix that, and good. Right? So in this case, I didn't want it to use a logger and so on. But I really want you to handle exceptions in the best possible way. Like, I see very often that people understood we have to lock exception. That's a good first start. But I think that should not be always the case, right? If we have some, some fallback solution that we can present to the user, right? For example, if we have a list of recommendations specific for this user, and now some connection to the database is gone, but we have some static file that we can read from. And when we can show some general recommendations, then this is still better than showing than just logging and, and showing how oh, gen general error uh, happened to the user, right? So we should work much more on that also. Okay. So what else? So I have extracted a lot into their own classes. Again, we're proceeding in baby steps. So this is far from clean yet, right? Um, this has to be, be improved a lot, but again. My step is still understanding the code, making code duplication more visible, and improving it step by step in baby steps. Okay? Also, I have extracted a factory. This factory is quite complex still, but the good thing here is now we are working on the separation of concerns that the setting up logic is in its own place. And I think that is already an improvement. And just don't do too much in one step because then you can seriously break your code, and that's what we don't want, right? Because even with this one test, it's not so safe, right? So be careful, baby steps. OK, and so forth and so on. Let's, let's speed a bit up. So now, if I look at this grid class, this has now become much smaller, right? And if you look at it, what do we see? Cells, find empty cell, iterating over the cells. Is the cell empty, empty? cell index. So I think the majority of the code now is related to a cell. And a cell is an int. And when I see this, right, then this code starts to speak to me, and I feel like there is a class being born. So this is the point where I say, oh, how about extracting that logic into its own class? So let's create a cell class. And because time is again pushing, almost 40 minutes used, um, I have already prepared that. I'm sorry. I would want to like code everything from scratch, but we would probably need three hours for that. So now we have here cell class. Um, this one is again final. I told you I like final. It's using a position class, which further encapsulates the whole logic. And this class I was even able to make immutable. Immutable is really nice. Uh, but talking about immutable again is its own talk. So. Um, this will help us a lot. We'll simplify our logic a lot. We'll make this thread safe even. And now I have encapsulated also this logic about how we calculate a row index, a column index, and a box index here just in this private constructor, right? And with this simple static off, I can really easily create my own position. Um, I think I did that same thing also in the cell, right? Because I like this uh, factory pattern so that even at the moment, this is final, but maybe later we, I'm changing my mind or the team changes the mind. We need some specific class, a Monday cell, I don't know, or JBCN cell. And in this case, maybe I don't want my users to know that. 
and because I have here this, I could just directly here return a new uh, JBCN cell, and the users wouldn't even notice, because as long as it's still a cell, right? Okay, so I have uh, uh, done some goodies here, and we can now use that. So now, let's start to replace my code, and let's, wherever I see that int was used for cell, let's now replace that with actually a cell. So find empty cell will be cell, this will be a cell, and now, if you see this method, you will actually probably notice here what we're doing here is filtering through cells. And 2019, I mean, Java is really old stuff, right? So we should all know we can like, easily filter this now, but careful, might be too much, right? Why not just keeping this simple? Introducing the cell concept is like big, really big. And maybe I'm, I'm exaggerating here a bit. I mean, obviously, this is not in this specific case, it's maybe not so big. You might disagree. But it's, uh, just keep in mind, you know, I'm trying to explain you a complex refactoring. So really, always stay in small steps. And so if you introduce a new concept like a class, I would just, at the moment, this code is not even compiling. So this is the most dangerous step that we have. So let's please make this code compile again, that the test runs. And when this is achieved, we can like, do more crazy stuff and introduce whatever we like. OK, so now let's really keep this simple. So here, I want to say, no, is the cell empty? Uh, rename this, cell is empty. OK, and then we return the cell, obviously. And now I have to return null. And this is also, you see, before I introduced this constant, now I will not use it anymore, so we will have to remove that again from my constant class and so on. So this is the kind of thing that the more you touch the code in iterations, you will refactor it over and over again, and you will revoke decisions that you before made. This is just the most safest way that we can have so that the code uh, does still compile. Okay. So, and now, returning null is also not so nice. I don't like this at the stage. But as I said, let's just make sure that this code compiles. OK. So here is the cell empty. This is a helper method that we actually don't need anymore. So we can remove it. Cell, cell. And now this is my favorite part of the whole refactoring. Because now, before this was this complex um, helper method that we're using, get me the row index from the cell index, kind of weird, right? Now we can remove all this again and just ask the cell, cell, give me the row index. And again, I can ask cell, oops, give me the column index. And cell, give me the box index. And we will now have to do this several times again because, as you see, this was used quite often, actually, right? So this is two things. On the one hand, I love this, because now my code gets nicer. But as I do this, I see, again, the next pain, because I see a lot of new duplicated code. This was always existing. But before, there was just so much crazy things that it was too much for, for my brain, at least my small brain. You probably are smarter than me. Um, so now I see things that before I might not have seen, right? So I have now the urge, let's directly improve this. No, don't. It's baby steps, let's do this later, right? So let's still proceed in this way. And we see this pain, we just keep it. OK, so this has to be cell. OK. And now cell.update. Oh, not int. So cell. Update, let's call this, no, let's leave it to have this faster. It's the time, 45 minutes. So I have to speed up because I actually want you to also be able to ask some questions. So maybe we stop here. So I guess you get the idea. I would normally finish this, but the time is proceeding. So I guess you again get the idea what we're doing. We are introducing now the cell concept and it gets better again. But we are still far from there. So let's go now to step four. And this for today will be the final step, even though it's not the final step, right? Um, 
So let's see what we do have now. So I have finished this uh, introduction of cell. On top, I have now done what I told you before. I have introduced here streams. So now I have a lot of one-liners. So now really, I think the code gets really nice. I have a has empty cell. I'm working on an optional. And I've read about optional that many people would disagree to use that in this way. And yes, they are in a way right, because they should be used like in a functional style. I'm abusing here of optional because I, I like the way that it talks to me in the code, because I don't like this now, because like, what is now? Ooh. But here, has empty cell, now speaks to me. Find an empty cell and tell me, is this cell actually present? Well, that's has empty cell, right? I think that's a no-brainer. Same here, get empty cell, find empty cell, and get, because I expect there is a cell, right? So I can trust that. Again, here, find empty cell, um, I have my stream, I filter it, is it empty? Okay, and find the first. So this is not really, really speaking. But the code is still not far from clean, um, because if I see this now here, row bit set, get, set, set, there's still a lot of code duplication. And when I was working on this code, I was further optimizing it, using a lot of more functional code, I removed this code duplication, but the code, in my perspective at least, was unreadable. So I was like, okay, let's revoke that, right? Because code readability is, in my opinion, the most important aspect, right? So it's always a balance, right? Duplication is evil, but uh, if it's unreadable, this, I think, is even more evil. So in this case, I decided to, to keep this as is. There's still a lot of things that we could do, especially here in the factory, right? This is totally unclean still. But at least I hope you got now the idea um, of how you can proceed in a refactoring. Okay. And with that, I thank you. Thanks for having me. Great honor. <laughs> Questions? No questions? So how much in total uh, uh, it lasted to refactor that code? You mean how, ma how many classes I have or? Uh, how much time did you spend uh, to refactor all the code? Well, depends on how you see it. Like I worked this on, on the several, several weeks to like get it into a state where I'm like super fast and I understand the code inside out. Um, but how much, so the question is more like how much, so probably your question is like how much time would, you, would this take you to, to refactor this code? And as I said, you can do this refactoring in a day, but you have to know what you're doing, right? So assuming that you don't know at, at the beginning what you're doing and you still need these learnings, I would estimate it as maybe five days. That, but that again depends, right? As always, it depends, like, do you really understand Sudoku? Or do you want to, first of all, and that's what I tell you, that's what I also had to do, buy a Sudoku, really understand the rules, don't be too quick, right? So take your time. Because if we underestimate the complexity of code, I mean, this is just, I, I totally underestimated this myself. Um, this was sent to me by, uh, because I, I did a, uh, a um, I asked for, for people to send me their code on, on LinkedIn, and one person sent me this code, and it was just 200 lines. So I was like, ah, I'm so smart. Uh, <laughs> this is too simple. This will not be good enough for, for, for this talk here, right? I wanted to have something more, more complex. But then I tried it, and I found that it's not so simple as it seems, right? Because all these small details, we, we overestimate what we can. That, that's just hu human, human uh, problem, right? So yeah, something between one and five, maybe even 10 days, depends, right? How fast, how smart you are. I'm sure you can do that in three hours. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great talk, thanks. So I think that uh, where is the uh, border between make uh, uh, between the decision make a refactoring or rewrite the code? Okay. Because uh, you said that it takes you I don't know about a week. And maybe it will be the time to rewrite this code. OK. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And 
This is also, again, the balance that we have to do, right? Um, the way you should do it, and I hope you will be able to do this, but you know, I'm also struggling with that. We all are struggling with that. So let's, not, let's just face it. But the way you should do this, as I presented this here today, is in really baby steps and not change the logic. Just change the code, but leave it exactly as is. But this very often is very difficult. And I also had some cases where I was like, for example, let me find one place. Um, in, I think in the online version I even showed that silently without saying that I was actually doing something evil. No, it's probably, no, now it's gone. I, can, oh, I just switched back to the first version and then I can show you. Oh, wait. Okay, let me switch to the first version. Because somewhere there was, yeah, this one here, this guy. This is the first start of really changing the code because here the code says uh, cell index smaller zero. And I looked at this find empty cell and I found out, well, actually what happens if, it's, uh, if there is no empty cell, he returns minus one. So let's change that, let's be smarter. And let's not just ask for smaller zero. What he really means here is equals equals minus one, right? And I did that. And in this case, I think it was okay-ish, right? Because this was so small, but still, I'm changing the code down. And just try to not do it, or just do it very limited because it's so dangerous. Just first improve the code, understand it, and once you are there, then you can like change the code and improve it. Okay? Thanks. Okay, so thanks. If you have more questions, you'll find me outside. <laughs>